Is the biggest aviation mystery of all time, the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370, about to be solved? Well, yes, if you believe the man you're about to meet. Richard Godfrey is no crackpot. He's a respected British aerospace engineer and physicist who says he's found the doomed airliner. If he's right, he'll provide desperately needed answers for the families of the 239 passengers and crew who were aboard the Boeing 777 when it vanished eight years ago. But knowing where it is isn't the end of the story. Richard also has to convince authorities to resume the search that's already cost hundreds of millions of dollars. At any hour of the day or night, thousands of amateur radio operators around the world, enthusiasts like Matthew Ayres, are talking to each other. Uh, QRZ uh, VK2 Bravo Alpha Italy calling. Their conversations crisscross the globe in a tangle of invisible radio waves. Often there's a lot of background noise, so you have to find the signal from the noise. It might seem too incredible to be true. But one man is now convinced these random ham radio signals have solved the eight-year-long mystery of the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370. So, Richard, you believe you know exactly where MH370 is? That's correct, yes. So from the moment MH370 took off, you have been able to track its every movement? Yeah, from takeoff right to the end. It's an enormous claim, but Richard Godfrey has little doubt. In fact, the retired British aerospace engineer and physicist is so sure about the final location of the Boeing 777, he wants immediate action. In my view, there's no reason why we shouldn't be preparing a new search and planning for that. So if we were to send a search party out there now, they'd be able to find it? It will only take one more search and we will find it. Among all the aviation experts working on the MH370 case, Richard Godfrey is the first and only one to investigate the signals of the ham radio operators on the night the aircraft went missing, the 8th of March, 2014. The breakthrough came when he discovered the distinct disturbances the plane made to radio waves when it flew through them. With that information, not only was Richard able to identify MH370, he could also track its precise flight path into the Indian Ocean. I'm looking to try and detect uh, anomalies in the signals reflected back from an aircraft. You can follow that data and you can see where an aircraft may have disturbed the radio signals, and you can pick up uh, those disturbances. Have these radio enthusiasts across the globe inadvertently helped you find MH370? Have they helped locate the missing wreckage? Indeed, they have. Not surprisingly, when news of Richard's research was first made public, there was scepticism, but also hope especially for people like Danica Weeks. Let's join the dots. If this isn't worth another search, then I don't know what is. Danica's husband, Paul, was one of the 239 passengers and crew on MH370. Still back at that day. It's just been such a long time with no closure, no answers. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, all these unknowns that have been plaguing your life for eight years now, does it keep you up at night still? There's not a day I don't think about it. Look, I promised Paulie I'd bring him home. I haven't fulfilled that promise yet. It feels just so haunting to be here. Um, For the past eight years, Danica Weeks has bravely taken on a role she never wanted, an advocate for the families who lost loved ones. Over that time, her search for help and answers has never wavered even arranging an audience three years ago... This is Janika Weeks. ..with the then Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. We intend to continue for as long as there is hope. I left there thinking that, yes, we've made a mark here. We are going to get the steps that we need and they're going to take action. 
and then it was deathly silent. And it was all just talk. I mean, the ocean's carrying a lot of secrets. Oh, it is. It's incredible that, you know, this long on, we still don't know where they are. Right? Now, though, for the first time in a long time, you know Richard Godfrey has given Danica a renewed sense of hope. I've done my research on it and it looks so promising. I, I when I, you know, re, I get goosebumps because I feel this is it. Richard's work in identifying MH370 using the disturbances in the signals of the ham radio operators communicating with each other on the night the plane disappeared meant he was able to track where it was flying. And he's confident in his analysis because the flight path he came up with mirrored the already known satellite tracking of MH370. However, there was one difference. Richard's data produced much more precise detail about the plane's route into the Indian Ocean. I mean, this is quite extraordinary. So are these dots that we're seeing on this flight path here represent the signals that are being sent every two minutes? That's right. There are in total 160 of these detections. So they've been disturbed by an aircraft, in this case, MH370. How can you be so sure that it was a plane, that it was MH370 that disturbed these radio frequencies? It's very easy because out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, there was just one other aircraft in, in several hours that passed, and that passed an hour's flying time away from MH370. So it's very easy then to discount you're picking up another aircraft and whether you're picking up MH370. So it can only be a plane that was picked up through this data? Yeah, it has to be an aircraft at a certain altitude and not picking up ships on, on the surface of the water or, or, or things like that. So why haven't we found it? Why aren't we looking? And why haven't we provided answers to 239 families? Well, why haven't we? Begs the question, doesn't it? Well, that's a question for government. It's uh, anyone involved in the search is, uh, feels the same way I do. Uh, we need to be out there, we need to be looking, and we, need, and, and we need to find it. That a modern airliner could ever not be found is a frightening thought for most people. For Peter Foley, it simply defies belief. For four years, he was in charge of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau's search for the plane, the most expensive in aviation history. Even today, he remains obsessed about locating MH370. I was once described by my boss as a zealot, and, you know, that connotes something that's a bit crazy, but I, I believe that, in a real sense, it was a good thing to be for MH370, and I wasn't the only one. I think there was literally hundreds of zealots and people who were pretty desperate to find that aircraft. Despite the failure to find MH370, Peter is proud of the efforts of his search team. He's also cautiously optimistic about Richard Godfrey's work, work that includes uncovering a very strange detail Godfrey says could explain why MH370 went missing in the first place. It does seem very strange when you're trying to lose an aircraft in the remotest part of the Southern Indian Ocean that uh, you enter a holding pattern for 20 minutes. When Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 with 239 people on board vanished in the Southern Indian Ocean eight years ago, Peter Foley was put in charge of finding it. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau operations chief failed, but not for want of trying. Four years ago, the $200 million search was called off, a decision the now retired Peter says was plain wrong. There's no one looking and no one has had a look since 2018. There's absolutely no reason why um, we're still sitting on our hands waiting for some credible new information leading to a specific location. There's absolutely no reason why that aircraft couldn't be found.
Peter's search for MH370 was exhaustive. 2,000 kilometres west of Perth, it covered an enormous 120,000 square kilometres of the southern Indian Ocean, but without luck. Now, aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey thinks he can narrow the search to a much smaller area, a mere 300 square kilometres. It includes some area that's already been looked at, as well as virgin seabed never before probed. Why would a search be any different this time? Why would we turn something up this time? With this very difficult terrain, um, it is possible uh, to, to miss wreckage. When you're going through 120,000 square kilometres, you, you get one chance, one pass of each point. With 300 square kilometres, you can afford in just a couple of weeks to go several passes from different angles. So it's possible the plan may have been missed in previous searches in an area like this? Um, it's possible. Having said that... Peter Foley, who now knows the southern Indian Ocean better than anyone, says Richard Godfrey's work needs more scrutiny, but it should certainly be taken seriously. Would that be a place to start? Richard's oh, finding absolutely. of 300 square kilometres? It, it was searched. So I will point out that lots of his area was searched by the ATSB back in 2014-15 and uh, wide of that area was searched also by Ocean Infinity, his, his point, but not all of it. So there is still a window, potentially? There's a small window, yeah. Is there any merit to Richard's work? I think um, there's certainly merit in exploring new avenues. I think the jury's still out as far as Richard's work's concerned and let's hope that he's onto something. If Richard Godfrey is onto something, his tracking of MH370's flight path not only pinpoints where the plane ended its journey, it also reveals an extraordinary quirk much earlier in the flight. Everyone has assumed up until now that there was a, a, a straight path, perhaps even on autopilot, perhaps even a ghost flight. I think there was an active pilot for the whole whole flight, and it certainly wasn't a straight line. One theory about why the plane disappeared was that the Malaysian pilot, Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah, had hijacked it in an act of political activism. And it's a theory now given more weight by Richard's more detailed flight path. Three hours into its journey, MH370 enters an oval-shaped holding pattern for 20 minutes. This point here is where the holding pattern takes place, which is strange to me when you're trying to lose an aircraft in, in the remotest part of the southern Indian Ocean, that uh, you enter a holding pattern for 20 minutes. What do you think was happening in that time? Do you think that's when he may have been communicating with the Malaysian government? He may have been communicating with the Malaysian government. He may have been checking whether he was being followed. He was, may have just simply wanted time to make up his mind where I go from here. I hope that if there was any contact with authorities in Malaysia, that uh, after eight years now, uh, they would be willing to um, divulge that. That someone, Captain Zahari most likely, killed all the passengers and deliberately flew MH370 into the middle of nowhere has long been debated. When the plane first went missing, Peter Foley and the ATSB discounted the theory. But time has changed Peter's view. So you think it's possible that the plane was piloted by an active captain? Well, um, it's possible that the plane was uh, piloted at the end, but we don't know for certain and we won't know until we find that debris. We have to find the debris to know precisely what happened on board that aircraft. It's the most likely scenario, isn't it? Yeah, by a wide margin. Mass murder-suicide? Um, well, if you put it like that, yes. Yes. It's chilling. It's horrifying. Desperation, more than anything else, might be driving Danika Weeks. 
But after eight years of waiting and with Richard Godfrey's help, she thinks she's finally close to finding out what happened to her husband, Paul, on flight MH370. I believe Richard Godfrey's findings are solid. And so why wouldn't they search? If they don't search, then I'd be wondering why not? Because this is, this is it. I feel this is it. You're that hopeful. Absolutely. This is like the golden goose, I believe. In the years since the plane vanished, Danica and her two boys, 11-year-old Lincoln and 8-year-old Jack, have had to live their lives. It hasn't been easy, but for Danica, meeting, and then two years ago, marrying John, has brought comfort and joy. The memory of Paul is always present, though. He sat me down one day and he said, if Paulie walks through that front door, I'll walk out the back door. And I knew then that he got it. it takes a lot of strength to say something like that, John. But it's true. It's hard to be that guy sometimes. Believe me, it is. It's hard. But there's days that you sort of wake up and go, well, is today going to be the day or...? What's it going to be like for Dan and the boys today? Together we want that closure that we so very much deserve. From his home in Frankfurt, Germany, Richard Godfrey has sent his research to the Malaysian government. As the owner of Malaysian Airlines, it's the only authority that can approve a resumption of the search for the plane wreckage. They say they're aware of Godfrey's work and they're waiting for more information. They're very polite and thank me for that. They say they're very busy, but... I, I can't imagine they'd be too busy to find a plane with 239 people on board that's been missing now for eight years. You would have thought that'd be their number one priority. Yeah, this is very important. However, if it turns out, for example, that the airline or the, uh, the pilot was in any way responsible, then they might be faced with uh, multi-million dollar claims. So maybe they would prefer um, that th this just quietly went away. But Peter Foley's former employer, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, is paying enormous attention to Richard Godfrey's research. In fact, it's so compelled, the Bureau has commissioned an independent review of its own data to assess if anything was missed in the original search. Other global experts are peer-reviewing Richard's work, with their results expected shortly. If there are enough positive reviews, it's hoped the ATSB will lobby the Malaysian government to reopen the search. What does the willingness of the ATSB to revisit some old data tell you? It tells us that there's people in the Bureau who are still dead keen to find that aircraft. And they should be, right? Absolutely, because they're people who, like me, uh, want to have answers for families. You know, 239 families are still, eight years later, sitting out there with no answers. And that was a promise that I made. I promised as an individual I'd do anything I could to bring those people home. And, and yeah, I, I think about it every day. Until now, no one's been able to crack aviation's greatest mystery. But Richard Godfrey is so certain he's right, he'd be prepared to bet money on it. If I had a couple of million to spare, uh, I'd be wanting to go out into the Indian Ocean tomorrow and, and, uh, and look for it. So you're that convinced? I'm sure this mystery will be solved. Um, and hopefully it'll be solved later this year. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.